In December of 1972, Apollo 17 was the sixth NASA mission to reach the moon. Fulfilling the vision of President John F. Kennedy, the American Space Agency had mustered enormous resources in an incredibly short time span, leaving their Soviet rivals behind. NASA's lunar missions, however inspiring, had run into their fair share of incidents. Think the tragic fire of Apollo 1 or the near disaster of Apollo 13. Public interest waned, Washington tightened the purse strings, and thus Apollo 17 astronauts Gene Cernan and Harrison Schmidt were the last humans to set foot on the moon. But the fire of ambition, fuel by science and healthy billion dollar budgets will propel NASA once more towards our pale nighttime companion. The next destination will be the moon's South Pole, a dark and mysterious area which promises to be a treasure trove of scientific discovery. But this time, the moon will be an intermediate station, humankind's gateway to an even more distant frontier. This is NASA's insanely ambitious Artemis program, a plan to establish a semi-permanent moon presence above the moon and lay down a gateway towards Mars. The Artemis program currently consists of four main planned missions aimed at returning to the lunar orbit and surface and are just part of the larger vision for space exploration dubbed by NASA as Moon to Mars. The foundations for this vision were laid down in 2004 during the administration of President George W. Bush with the clear ambition of sending humans back to the moon and eventually to Mars. From this perspective, Artemis makes for a perfect name. In ancient Greek mythology, she was the personification of the moon, but before that, she was worshipped as goddess of the hunt, portrayed with a bow and arrow. We like to think that Artemis will thus nook one of her arrows and shoot humankind toward the red planet. The current program was consolidated by President Donald Trump's Space Policy Directive 1, instructing NASA to achieve a lunar landing by 2024. But as we shall see, ambition makes for complicated projects, and this date may slip to 2026. So, Artemis includes four main missions. Cool. Well, Artemis is one to four, plus a side quest with incredibly exciting potential called Viper. In short, Artemis one and two are two preparatory missions, the first of which will be unmanned to test the capabilities of NASA's deep space exploration systems, an array of vectors and crafts which include the Orion module. This is the vessel which will eventually take astronauts to the moon during Artemis three. And by the end of Artemis four, NASA and other international partners will have established an orbiting space station in the lunar orbit called Gateway. But let's proceed in order, shall we? We are happy to report that Artemis 1 was already conducted with success at the end of 2022. The purpose of this unmanned orbital flight mission was to test for the first time the deep space exploration systems. These include the earthbound exploration ground systems in Cape Canaveral, the Space Launch System Vector, or SLS, currently the world's most powerful rocket, and the jewel in the crown, the spacecraft Orion. This consists of two components, a crew module and a service module which boasts a propulsive system developed by the European Space Agency. The SLS lifted off from Cape Canaveral on November the 16th, 2022, propelling the remote-controlled Orion towards the moon. Over the next 25 days, the craft traveled a distance of 1.4 million miles, performing two lunar flybys. At its farthest, Orion achieved a distance of 270,000 miles from Earth in a calculated decision to stress its crew support systems. For context, the farthest ever humans have ventured into space was approximately 248,000 miles during the Apollo 13 mission. After a largely successful flight on December the 11th, 2022, Orion whizzed through our atmosphere at 24,581 miles per hour before splashing down in the Pacific Ocean west of Baja, California. Orion performed its duties splendidly, but NASA engineers identified a design flaw in one of the life support system's valve circuits. This may sound like a tiny detail, but it carries consequences. Such a flaw may cause a malfunction, leading to a dangerous buildup of carbon dioxide in the crew module. Carbon dioxide is really great for plants, but NASA astronauts tend to belong to the human species, which thrive on the right concentration of oxygen. Hence, engineers had to take apart much of the Orion in order to locate and fix the right valve circuit. The additional work was bound to cause a delay on the next phase of the program, Artemis II. But while the NASA repair shop's busy at work, let's take a look at the side quest that we hinted at earlier. The Volatiles Investigating Polar Exploration Rover, aka Viper. This mobile robot is scheduled to land on the lunar south pole at the end of 2024 on a mission to find ice and other resources to be used by future future stages of Artemis. The small robot will roam the craters of the South Pole, areas which are permanently cloaked in shadows. As such, they are amongst some of the coldest spots in the entire solar system, where ice reserves have resisted for billions of years. The data collected by the rover will provide us invaluable clues about the origins and distribution of water over the lunar surface and on how to harvest this potential resource. NASA have proudly described Viper as the first ever resource mapping mission on another celestial body. The potential of the Viper is immense. Think about the possibility of harvesting water on the spot, both to conduct experiments on the origin of our most precious liquid.
liquid or simply to serve the need of a permanent human presence on the moon. The Orion unmanned flight was to be followed in 2024 by Artemis II, but NASA reports that it will now take place no earlier than September 2025. Artemis II will consist of a crewed flyby of the moon taking place over 10 days. The key objectives will be once more to test Orion's life support systems, this time with astronauts on board. The selection crew will also practice essential operations for a future moon landing. Speaking of the chosen few, the Orion passengers have actually already been announced. The mission commander will be Reed Wiseman, a systems engineer and former naval aviator who became an astronaut in 2009. Wiseman has already traveled to space as a flight engineer on the International Space Station in May to November of 2014. The pilot of the Orion craft will be Victor Glover, also a naval aviator with 24 combat missions on his military resume. Glover holds three masters in science, military operations, and art, became an astronaut in 2013, and also served as a flight engineer on the ISS in 2021. The crew will be complemented by two mission specialists, Dr. Christina Cook and Jeremy Hansen. An astronaut since 2013, Cook was also an ISS Illuminus back in 2020, a stint during which she participated in the first all-female spacewalk and set a record for the longest single spaceflight by a woman. Finally, physicist and fighter pilot Jeremy Hansen is not an astro astronaut as he joined the Canadian Space Agency in 2011. He will set a record, in fact, for becoming the first Canadian to travel around the moon. According to current plans, the mission will begin with the SLS rocket lifting Orion into orbit. The craft will then orbit twice around the Earth, allowing for the crew to test Orion's systems while still close to home. For example, they will evaluate the performance of the life support systems, both during rest and exercise periods. The astronauts and their buddies back at Mission Control will also stress test NASA's deep space network capabilities, which will be used to communicate with all future Artemis missions. After a first full orbit, the crew will fire the service module engines, lifting it to a high Earth orbit. This maneuver will develop the necessary speed required for the eventual push toward the moon. Finally, the astronauts will perform a TLI, or translunar injection burn, a further thrust which will send Iran on a four-day trip, traveling up to 4,600 miles beyond the far side of the moon, and back, of course. Interestingly, after the TLI burn, the crew should not need to use Orion's engines again, as the trajectory has been calculated to efficiently harness the Earth-Moon gravity fields as a means of propulsion. Despite the already announced delays, NASA seems confident that Artemis II will be a success, announcing that this mission will pave the way to land the first woman and first person of color on the moon as part of Artemis III. Was this a reference to pilot Victor Glover and specialist Christina Cook? Well, the space agency has not announced who will join Artemis III, but we already have plenty of details about the mission. In September 2026, Artemis III should depart from Launch Pad 39B in Cape Canaveral, with the SLS rocket firing Orion beyond the atmosphere. Most of the SLS will detach from the craft, except for its last stage, the Interim Cryogenic Propulsion Space, or ICPS. After a brief stay in Earth's orbit for routine checks, the ICPS will give Orion its next kick in the backside towards the moon before detaching from the craft. As they approach the moon, the crew will execute two consecutive engine burns calculated to specifically intercept the Near Rectilinear Halo Orbit, or NRHO. This appears to be the perfect choice. By staying on the NRHO, Orion will maintain near constant communications with mission control. Moreover, this orbit is gravitationally balanced between the Earth and Moon, which will allow for fuel efficiencies. So far, so simple. Well, in relative terms at least. But here comes the complicated part. In previous moon landing missions, NASA astronauts descended to the lunar surface by using a dedicated module, which detached from their main craft. In this case, they will get a lift from Elon Musk instead, or rather, his commercial space agency, SpaceX. Here's how it's going to work. SpaceX will provide NASA with a human landing system, an uncrewed craft simply named Starship. Days before the launch of the Orion and crew from Cape Canaveral, SpaceX will launch their unmanned Starship into Earth orbit. Here, the private craft will make a refueling stop at a pre-positioned storage depot before firing its thrusters towards the moon. Starship will then intercept NHRO and chill out until Orion shows up. Once the crewed NASA the craft shows up, the two vessels will dock. Two astronauts will board Starship and descend upon the lunar South Pole, while the other two will continue to orbit the moon for about six and a half days. During their time on the South Pole, the two astronauts will don their suits and spacewalk systems provided by contractor Axiom. They will then set out to explore. This will be a particularly challenging task. Some areas of the South Pole are flooded by unforgiving sunlight, while others are shrouded by shadows which have not been lifted in billions of years. Thus, temperatures range between the extreme low of minus 203 Celsius to highs of 54. That's minus 334 and 130 Fahrenheit, by the way. As they navigate this extreme environment, the two astronauts will capture footage, retrieve samples, conduct geology surveys, and collect necessary data to accomplish the objectives of the Artemis science plan. The plan seeks to reveal new findings about the history of the Sun, for example, by studying the effects of solar wind upon the lunar south pole. Another exciting objective involves understanding the cycles of lunar polar volatiles. 
clarify here, volatiles are solid elements or compounds which change state at even moderately warm temperatures. The Hummel ice cube is a volatile as it turns from solid to liquid when temperatures rise above zero degrees Celsius. But why are lunar volatiles so important? Well, according to Jake Bleacher, NASA's chief exploration scientist, lunar volatiles are likely trapped in permanently shadowed regions of the moon and have a story to tell us about the history of the solar system. Some of the volatile samples collected during Artemis III may be up to 4.5 or even 5 billion years old and may provide detailed data about the history of the Earth-Moon system. According to NASA.gov, this data may even help prove the theory that the moon may have originated from the collision between Earth and a smaller planet. After six days of intense exploration and using Starship as a base, the two astronauts will board the SpaceX craft and head back to the near rectilinear halo orbit for a docking appointment with Orion. Using the craft's own engines, the astronauts will sling past the moon, traveling at almost 25,000 miles per hour before they're splashed down in the Pacific Ocean. As mentioned earlier, these events are scheduled to take place in September 2026, but the plan may incur delays, as reported by the U.S. Government Accountability Office, or GAO. Following an inspection in November 2023, this body found that NASA is facing challenges with its Artemis contractors, SpaceX and Axiom. The GAO reported how SpaceX planned to develop their Starship in 79 months. This is exceedingly ambitious considering that it would take NASA 92 months on average to develop a similar project. In fact, the GAO pointed out that SpaceX had to delay certain milestones in their project plan, such as an orbital flight test. And there's another snag. SpaceX's plan was to launch a sort of orbiting refueling station, where Starship could fill up before flying to the moon. But according to the GAO, NASA documentation states that SpaceX has made limited progress maturing the technologies needed to support this aspect of its plan. More delays may be caused by the design of the spacesuits. Contractor Axiom leverage previous designs developed by NASA, but it appears that, quote, NASA's original design did not provide the minimum amount of emergency life support needed for the Artemis III mission. As a result, Axiom representatives said that they may redesign certain aspects of the spacesuit, which could delay its delivery for the mission. These hurdles are almost certain to have a knock-on effect on the next phase of the Moon to Mars roadmap, the Artemis IV mission. In our humble opinion, this is the most exciting stage so far, as it will involve establishing Gateway, a multi-purpose space station in the moon's orbit. Gateway will provide logistical support to future lunar missions and act as a staging point for deep space exploration beyond the moon and eventually to Mars. The space station will consist of a total of four modules where astronauts will live, conduct experiments, and prepare for surface missions. The construction of the two main components seems to be proceeding on schedule, according to NASA.gov. The first module is the Habitation and Logistics Outpost, or HALO, developed by contractors Northrop Grumman and Thales Alenia Space. HALO is going to be connected to the power and propulsion element, or PPE module, built by contractor Maxar. Then finally, it will be outfitted with its scientific payload, designed to gather data on space weather, a term which encompasses solar wind, coronal mass ejections, and solar flares. The effect of such phenomenon on astronauts and spacecraft in deep space is not entirely known, and an accurate study is paramount before shooting our arrows towards the red planet. The scientific instrumentation loaded onto Gateway will therefore analyze the electrons present in the solar winds, measure the levels of radiation deposited on living tissue, and study how to shield astronauts from the risk of cancer or cardiovascular diseases. Two-thirds of these instruments will be provided by the European Space Agency and JAXA, its Japanese counterpart, with cooperation also by the Canadian Space Agency and the Mohammed bin Rashid Space Center in Dubai. Once the first two modules of Gateway are in good shape, they will be launched beyond orbit by another big contractor, SpaceX with their Falcon Heavy rocket. Halo and PPE will then take position in the lunar orbit, waiting for more modules to arrive. The next delivery will once again come courtesy of Mr. Musk, as a Starship landing system and a Dragon XL logistics module will join Gateway while it waltzes around the moon. Please note that at this point, every stage of the mission is all going to be entirely unmanned. We will see a human presence again only in 2028, with the launch of Artemis IV proper, a crewed mission consisting of the good old Orion craft and the International Habitation Module, or IHAB, an expansion to Gateway's living quarters provided by ESA and JAXA. After a launch propelled by JAXA's own SLS rocket, Aram will essentially tow IHAB to its destination. IHAB will then dock with Halo, and the crew of Artemis IV will enter Gateway to prepare for their surface expedition. After a six-day program of moonwalks, experiments, and sample collection, the entire Orion crew will undock from Gateway and return to Earth. The space station will be left behind unmanned, but fully functional and fully equipped, ready to welcome more trips to the moon and beyond.
At the time of preparing this episode, NASA has shared details only for missions Artemis 1 through 4, but we know that the program will extend at least up to a seventh installment. On April the 10th, 2024, NASA Administrator Bill Nelson and the Japanese Minister of Education, Cult, Sports, Science and Technology, Mashito Moriyama, concluded an agreement regarding their cooperation in a future Artemis 7 mission scheduled no earlier than 2031. As part of the deal, JAXA will contribute a pressurized lunar rover called Lunar Cruiser. This vehicle will be designed to transport two astronauts across the moon's surface with an autonomy of up to 30 days per trip and an overall lifetime of 10 years. In exchange, NASA will ensure that two JAXA astronauts will have a spot on future landing missions. If everything goes according to plan, this could mean that as of 2031, Japan may be the second nation to land its citizens on the moon after the United States. But consider this. As of the current US fiscal year, NASA's expenditure on the Artemis program has reached the $93 billion mark. This calculation includes all expenses occurred since 20 2011 when the development of the Orion craft kicked off. For comparison, the budget invested on the Apollo program from 1960 to 1973 amounted to $280 billion adjusted for inflation. So it looks like the American Space Agency is now able to deliver a comparable, if not more extensive program at a third of the cost, which is pretty amazing. But the space frontier of the 21st century involves new players, which are as ambitious and as determined as NASA, but arguably are able to deliver more cost efficiencies. For example, ISRO, the Indian Space Agency, was able to launch a satellite to Mars orbit at a lower price than it took to make Ridley Scott's film The Martian. And they've even worked out realistic plans to land astronauts on the moon by 2040. The real challenge to NASA, though, may come from the China National Space Administration, CNSA, scheduled to put boots on lunar ground in 2030. Moreover, China, Russia, and six other partner nations have entered a relationship to develop an outpost on the lunar south pole, much like the Gateway Project. From this perspective, we can very much say that the space race is still alive and kicking and as exciting as ever. Our hope is that this race will be conducted in the spirit of healthy competition rather than rivalry, so that the achievements of each national space agency will spur their counterparts to do more, better, and faster, as well as cheaper, thus propelling humankind as a whole towards an ever more distant horizon.